Hey guys, Joe Pye here. Welcome back to Advanced Innovation. Sorry, been off the grid for a little while. Had a bunch of big jobs I had to clear out. And then I decided to take a few days off and uh, get some R and R. You know, if you work real hard, you got to treat yourself once in a while, or you burn out. Anyway, this was a video that I've been wanting to shoot for a while, and it's about shop gremlins and things that just happen, and you just can't quite put a finger on the why and the and the how and the you know what's going on. Anyway. It doesn't matter if you're a plumber, an electrician, a car mechanic, a machinist, it doesn't matter what profession you are, the worst kind of problem to have is an intermittent problem. And if you can rule out certain variables that could possibly introduce an intermittent problem into your machining environment, well then you're ahead of the game, right? And you know, or you'll be able to better identify what's going on with your parts. I'm going to walk out to the shop in a minute after I put a picture up here on the board. And I'm going to run a part, and I'm going to set it up several different ways, actually in several different machines, not several different ways, and it's going to look solid, it's going to appear solid, and I'm not going to make any narratives about what I'm doing wrong or what could potentially be wrong with what I'm doing. So as you watch what I'm doing out in the shop, see if you can make mental notes and go, oh, this is going to happen, or hey, that's not going to work. And then when we go back over it, you can pat yourself on the back or high-five the guy next to you and say, I knew it. So... I've seen a lot of people do what I'm going to demonstrate and superficially it looks fine and the techniques look fine and you would think that the setups are robust enough to be consistent but when the shop gremlins sweep in and all your dimensions start going all over the place you just got to scratch your head and go I have no idea what happened so if I can kill a couple of them for you it might make your life easier in the long run and certainly give you something to think about going forward. Alright, simple part, simple stupid part we're going to have a round part, small diameter, maybe 5 16 ish, with a cross hole in it that goes through. So, looking at it from the end, it's round, goes through. Now, the dimension on this part, you're going to have an OD, plus or minus 5. You're going to have a length, which is a little bit more critical. Let's just say the engineer gave you two, two thousand. And from the end of the part to the center of the hole, let's call that two as well. That's kind of close for a cross hole, but just for the sake of demonstration, let's call that two as well. All right, now the scenario surrounding this particular small, let's say 15, 20 piece job that you would do in an engine lathe, you don't have the material to cut it from to do it from net shape stock, so you got to turn it down. Not a problem. Happens every day, right? Simple part. Plus or minus 5 on the OD, plus or minus 2 on the overall, 2 on the position of the hole and the diameter of the hole, we're not going to worry about that, we're just going to say plus or minus 10, 15, whatever. Alright, that's pretty good. Let's go out, make one, run it through a couple of setups, set a couple of stop style machine ins, lock everything down and make a part, and then I'm going to say, hey, this is what's going to happen and this is why. Let's take a walk. Well, it's not an ideal scenario, but the only material available for this job is half inch. So we're going to turn 5 16 diameter material down. 312. Parts are two inches long, so I'm going to turn it to about two inches 200, so there's room for the parting tool.
Okay, 312 and a half right on the button right here at the nose. You know, I think for the duration of this job, since I have my number at four on the dial and three cuts seems excessive, I'm just gonna go for two. I'm gonna split it 50-50 and we'll take equal cuts just to expedite the process. By laying a scale against your parting tool and keeping gentle pressure on it, as you move your carriage in, you can watch where the part protrudes to on the scale. You can get pretty close to a finished overall length. I'm gonna leave a little bit on there for facing off. Okay, well we're gonna do that nine more times. And then we're gonna flip the part over and we are gonna put a stop in a 5 16 collet and we're gonna face them off the length. Let's take a look at that setup. If you're familiar with the 5C collet, the majority of these collets have an internal thread on the end. Some of them actually do not, so if you're going to make the investment in 5C collets, make sure you get the ones with the internal thread. This is a 5 16th collet which is going to accept the part that we just turned down on the lathe. Well, it should. There you go. Now, with the part sticking out of the collet this long, you can expect a taper from here to here because as the tool comes in contact and turns it, it's going to push it away. And as it deviates from center, naturally the radius would get bigger and the end would get bigger as well. I'll bet you if I turn this around it slips right into this collet rather easy. Sure does. Okay, so that would indicate a little taper on the end. But you know what? It's plus or minus 5 diameter. Who cares? As long as it's within spec. Now there's a couple of different kinds of stops you can use for this. This one here is for a solid rod. Screw it down. It's got a cross hole in it with a set screw. You can load your bar in and set the length of your part by adjusting the insertion distance of your stop. If you're going to put a piece in a collet Make sure the end of your piece is nice and clean because if there's any burrs or projections, protrusions, positives coming from the end, as it hits the face of a solid stop, it's going to stand proud because of what's right here. And when you take that off, you're going to find that your part is now undersized. If you do have a protrusion right here and you just don't have the time to knock it off or you're going to drill a hole in after the fact, then use a stop with a hole in it so any positives go down inside of the stop. If the part is real short and the whole part is going to register within the nose of the collet, make sure the stop that you select is smaller than the OD of the part and the ID of your collet. If it's a longer part, you can use an extended stop like this one here. That I made. If you want even more, you can put extensions on the extensions. And before you know it, you can really build yourself something rather long. So I have extension tubes. I have extended hard stops. I have a six inch. I have the screw type with the soft tip so it doesn't mar. Never been a big fan of the screw type, but they do have their place if you're putting a lot of load on them. This little nubby kind right here is my favorite. And I am going to use this neck down stop. I'm going to go over to the vise, torque everything down, come back to the lathe. Stay tuned. This is the final setup. The little adapter is screwed in nice and tight. This is a 3 8 diameter drill blank that's been turned down to a quarter of an inch on the end. So that if I needed to, it could come all the way through to the tip of this and we could do real shallow pieces. I know that there's nothing on the end here. The burrs have been removed and the overall length of this part is set such that when I do face it off it's not so close to the collet that I can't get my hands on it. So let's put this back in the machine, face this off to exactly two inches and run the rest of them.
Take a nice small pass on the park initially. A couple of thousandths just to clean it up. Zero out your digital or your travel dial or your drop indicator. And face it off. There's really no need to deburr this at this time because if there's a burr on the part from this particular cut, it's going to be towards the outside and not towards the overall length of the part. So it's not going to affect your overall length measurement. When you check the part, check it at the very edges and check it in the center too. That'll indicate whether or not your ends are flat. Twenty-three more to get to exactly two inches. Keep gentle pressure against the stop. Make sure the ends of the part are clean. Lock it down. If you're going to be doing work like this and you're going to be leaning over a collet quite often and using a uh, file to deburr the end of your part, you may wish to take your file over to the belt sander and sand the teeth off and soften the edges of this particular side or one side of your file and turn that into what's called a safe side. That way you can rub against the face of this collet all day and you're not going to scar it up. That's exactly what I've done with this one and it works quite well. Now that I know this piece is exactly two inches long, I'm going to throw the other nine pieces in and I'm going to face them off at the zero setting and take it over to the mill. So let's speed this process up and just take it over to the mill right away and not show the other nine getting machined. All right, let's assume that you know the back jaw of your vices true because you just trammed it and you know it's true and you want to find a specific offset for when you put your part in your vise you want to come forward if you don't feel like tramming the actual part well you can do the jaw it's just like a translated surface that I showed you on the four jaw chuck stick a piece of material one two three block anything that you can trust in your jaws and put somewhat equal pressure on it that you're going to use during production that way if there is any movement or deflection you're in the same ballpark. A lot of production facilities that use vices for production use torque wrenches on the vise to keep the closure pressure extremely consistent and assure that the feature is good. So let's get this to kick out, set our zero spot, and we can move off for the center line of a 312 diameter pin. thou diameter edge finder and it's got a center finder feature on the other end so I'm now going to crank it in instead of going a hundred and zeroing out the digital and then 156 for the center I am just going to go exactly 256 so that there's no lag time in the digital or whatever so here we go 256 that is 156 which is half of 312 and half of the lead diameter on the edge finder. 256 it is. 
Now since you're standard parallels, you may have wider parallels, but my parallels are an eighth of an inch. If you have eighth inch wide parallels and you're going to put a 156 wide part on it, well the part's going to ride on the edge of the parallel and not the flat. So space it out or use two. I choose to use two. And now I'm going to reset the stop. There we go. Two parallels. A very small spring to keep the parallels together and pressed against the back jaw. The projection of my stop is still less than the thickness of my part. You want the center line of your part to be below the jaws. And we should be good to go. I know the dimension on the print was, let's call it 200, so we're going to hit the end of this part and we're going to dial it in 200. Let's see what we get. Hey guys, there's a good rule of thumb for you. If you're going to be picking up the end of a part and you're not sure what condition the face of your part is, if there's a part off tit or some other feature that would cause a false reading, then keep your edge finder above center when you make contact. That way any positive features in the center are not going to influence the reading that the edge finder gets and put you in a bad location. I'm going to move in 250 thou here. If I said something different before, forgive me, I'm not doing this from a print. This is all uh, theoretical. So I'm going to move in a quarter of an inch and I'm going to pop a hole directly in the center of this part. Same thing with the y-axis setting. Instead of taking your digital or whatever method you're going to use, especially a digital, sometimes they cross over from a positive to a negative range and the accuracy or resolution when it does that, it doesn't translate. So it's nice to have one continuous move. So half the 200 diameter plus the 250 dimension, I'm going to go for a 350 shift on my x-axis. Three fifty. Make sure the part is tight. Let's pop the hole. This is three sixteen stainless. Love it. Now you will have a crown on the top and a crown on the bottom. You're going to have to put it back in a lathe and file it off. But I'm set from my Y in. I'm set from my X in. 250. Life is good. I'm going to do this to the rest of the parts. Okay. 
Well, because this was a theoretical demonstration and not an actual job, I'm going to say that I don't know what happened. The length of my parts, they're all different. The distance from here to the center line of my hole, well, not only is it off from here to the center line, but it's off side to side. I used solid stops on everything, and I was pretty sure it was going to come out good, but, boy, I don't know. So, uh, maybe we're going to have to call the boss over here and say, hey, guy, I got 10 pieces, and they're all different. You know, maybe you have one or two that are to print, but I don't know what happened. I think I did everything right, but, gee, not this time. It didn't work out. Shop Gremlin swooped down and got a piece of this job. So, let's go back in on the board and evaluate all the setups and take a look at exactly what happened. All right, now, some of those problems that you just witnessed out in the shop happen for really good reasons, but if you're not thinking about what's going on, then those reasons are going to be the reasons that nag at you and introduce variations in your parts. And if you're checking your parts as you go and they're varying all over the place and you continue to make adjustments, well, you're going to be chasing your tail for a long time. So let's start with the very first item on the list. When you turn down the material for the very first time and you change the number of passes it takes to get from your net shape stock to your required diameter, you introduce the variable into the equation that is going to give you mixed results. If you change anything in the process, it is very important to requalify that process or continue to monitor the result. If you're taking three passes on a part, which is what we're doing, and then you back it off to two because, hey, it looks like a good idea. The load on the tool is different. The deflection of the tool is different. The load on the material is different. The heat is different. And the deflection of the material is different. And God only knows what the result's going to be. So if you change the number of passes, even on an NC CNC machine, make sure you double check the diameters after you make that pass. Good rule of thumb. Okay. Now the diameter changes. This is where you're going to get bit. You have, let's say for sake of example, we used a 5C collet. Put my eyeballs on so I can see this. Here's your 5C collet profile. Drastic, of course, it looks more like an R8, but let's call it a 5C for, for yucks. Here's the nose cone of your machine. That's a pretty sad looking nose cone, but let's just say, there's your nose cone. Draw bars back here. You've got your stop in your collet. Part sitting in the collet. And this is where the plane of the tool is coming in. This is the zero on your travel dial, on your dial indicator, on your digital readout, whatever. Well, what do we have here? If this diameter of this part changes, because on the print it was plus or minus 5, and you said, okay, well, it's plus or minus 5, I'm going to use that, you might want to think ahead in this situation. As this diameter increases, it does not have to go as far into the nose cone of the machine as a smaller diameter, because as this taper draws back into the machine to close down to the smaller diameter, well, your stop surface right here is going into the machine. So what's going to happen to the part if the diameter is smaller? It's going to get longer because this stop is now going in with the draw bar while you're standing there. Boom. So a smaller diameter equals a longer part. Well, it only goes to prove that if it's a bigger diameter, it won't have to go as far in before the taper engages the OD. So, there you go. Bigger diameter equals a smaller length. So let's say this is your diameter here, and this is your overall length, OAL. You're going to hear me say that from time to time, so get used to it. Overall length. Smaller diameter, longer part. Bigger diameter, shorter part. So the plus or minus 5 that you felt so comfortable with all initially came back and bit you because you said, oh, well, I'm just going to use it. If you have a dimension that you're going to be banking from, as you continue to process your parts, and you have a plus or minus 5, 
you might want to hold that a little bit tighter. So you start good and you'll end good. It will make the whole job a lot easier. So if the length of your part was varying, it was the diameter that did it. Keep that in mind. All right. Now that you have a whole table full of parts and the diameters are different, the way the job was set up was a catastrophe waiting to happen to begin with. You have the stationary jaw on your vise, you have the movable jaw on your vise, and because it's a through hole in the part, you can't drill all the way through the part while it's sitting on a hard parallel because you're going to hit the parallel, so you hung the part off the end of the machine, this way. When the diameter of that part varies, as it gets bigger or smaller, since you set your zero on the back jaw, you have a constant to a specific dimension, but as this part grows and shrinks, that hole is all of a sudden off-center. It's all because of the OD of the part change that the hole is off-center. Another reason that hole is going to end up off-center. If you do something like this, you cannot trust that the movable jaw on your vise is going to squeeze that part with any type of integrity if this part doesn't extend to at least beyond center. It's going to hit it, it's going to kick, and then when that happens, you have a situation, um, this is drastic so bear with me, you have a situation that looks like this. Now this part doesn't know where to register. It doesn't know where to register against the back surface or this surface. So the potential for this part to jump around upon projection is 50-50. You never know what you're going to get. And you're also only holding on the very back of the part because it's like sticking a cylindrical part into a conical shape. It's only going to register at the very end. How do you get around that? Use another part. Take one of the parts that are in the bin or staged or already done or whatever and stick two pieces in the vise. And no matter how sloppy that back jaw is, when it comes closed and it hits the same diameter on either side, it's going to pinch and you're going to have a lot of integrity in the setup and the chances of your part bouncing around because it's not registered correctly is going to be reduced. I'm not going to say it's going to be eliminated because it's hanging out over the parallel and it could do the, as you come down with the pressure from your drill, the part could sag. So if you want to control the center line feature of a hole, this is really not the way to do it. We'll get back to it. The dimension of the hole from the end in. Put it in, you set your hard stop, you saw me do it. Locked it down, put the part in, locked that down, all good, edge fine, moved in. I know exactly what this dimension is because I just zeroed and moved in. Guess what? Come back to Mr. Overall Length there because you let that diameter of the OD get bigger and smaller. The parts got longer and shorter. What happens when the parts get longer and shorter? When you zeroed from the end of the part. This dimension, out the window. This dimension is going to migrate and jump around with the deviations present at the overall length of the part. Safest way to do that, and we're still going to come back to it because I know a lot of you are going, oh God, he's just not doing that right, so hang in there with that thought. If you have a dimension from a given surface, you want to be able to make a setup that's going to deliver a quality feature regardless of what the part looks like. So with a setup like this, the better choice for registration would have been the hard surface here. It doesn't matter if this part is 16 inches too long. If you set this dimension here, you're always going to have the dimension on the print. So if you build a fixture, try to build the fixture based on where the dimension is given from. Don't assume anything and just incorporate all the variables in your mind that could happen and get around the issue. All right, now the bigger diameter. Because I know a lot of you guys are saying, that hole is never going to be on center because of this right here. 
because the plus or minus 5 on the print allowed you to relax when you were turning them down. Part diameter varies. If you're holding it sideways in the vise, you're dead meat. Finished. It's not ever going to be on center. Maybe one or two, but not all of them. Here's your vise again. If you have diameters of different sizes and you want to drill a hole in the middle of each one and you don't want to have to indicate sweep, tram, or pickup, or whatever for each part, then make yourself a setup that it won't matter. And you know what's going to do that for you? A V-block. Got a hard stop in your jaws, put a V-block in here and hold your parts perpendicular to the back jaw. Locate your dimension from the hard stop. The V is going to keep the part centered no matter what that diameter looks like. It's going to be a symmetrical tangent on both sides. That center line is going to stay put. And it doesn't matter if your parts vary 20 thousandths or 100 thousandths in diameter. By putting them in a V block and sweeping that V block on the first part, that feature is going to come right down in the center of whatever diameter you sit in that V-block. Okay, you're going to say, well, fine, you can't push a big drill through because there's a V-block in the way. Don't use a static V-block. Don't use a brown and sharp match set V-block. Take a piece of aluminum, set it at 45 degrees, and put a notch in it. That way you can drill right down through your part, right into the V-block. No problem. It's a nest. It's a, it's a fixture. Put it in your box and use it the next time. Ideal setup right there for the cross hole. The part is on the center of the movable jaw, so the jaw is not going to have a tendency to kick. You're using a V-block, which is going to accommodate the plus or minus 5 variation in all of the parts that you did. You have the end registration surface on the dimension on the print up against your hard jaw, and you've set and moved off for your hole. So you've got your hole being consistent regardless of the length. You've got it in the middle regardless of the diameter. You've got a nice steady setup right here. It's a win-win situation, guys. Make sure that if you're going to locate parts for secondary tooling operations, secondary feature operations, think about this. Think about the fact that I showed you that when a part diameter changes, it migrates into the collet or out of the collet. Now this doesn't usually happen with a chuck because a chuck grip is, is planar. Although if it's a short part and you've watched some of my other videos, you'll know that as you tighten it down, it's going to kick. So there could be some change in the overall length if you do it that way. But with a collet and you start varying in diameters, you're definitely going to get bit if you don't control it. So I hope this helped. I hope you like this. That's just some of the ways of ruling out some of the gremlins in production jobs and the ones that really will bite you the most, the jobs or the errors that you're going to make are going to be the ones that are the most simple. You're going to relax when you come to that feature or that dimension. Boom. Gotcha. Anyway, make a note of that. Hope you liked what you saw. I've seen a lot of guys do this and a lot of guys struggle. And when someone finally tells them what's going on, they say, wow, why didn't I think of that? Anyway, Joe Pye Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. Thanks for watching. That's all I got. I'm out.